300 years ago, ancient Egypt was ruled by a succession of Greek kings, but its culture and religious beliefs stretched back thousands of years before that. At the heart of these traditions was their belief that the soul was immortal. In the north of the kingdom, on a desert plain at Saqqara, the oldest expression of this belief was the temple and step pyramid of King Djoser, his resting place for eternity. In the south, around the later capital of Thebes, tombs and chapels and elegant temples testified to the same belief, that prayers and rituals could guide the soul of the deceased into a new life in the next world. Both king and commoner had the same hope. During this time, in the provincial town of Asyut, midway down the Nile, a man named Pad Debahu Asit died. According to custom, his body would have been mummified, placed in a coffin, and buried in a tomb in the western hills. But because he was a man of means, Pad Debahu Asit was buried within two beautifully decorated nesting coffins. The inner one, which contained the actual mummy, is called an anthropoid coffin because its form resembles the human body. It nestled within an outer coffin whose straight sides and gently sloping lid would have reminded ancient Egyptians of shrines built to honor their gods. His body doubly protected, Pa Debahu Asit's spirit was free to begin its journey into the next world. Over the course of two millennia, his mummy was lost and his marvelous coffin ensemble languished out of public view in a private collection in Switzerland. Then the coffins appeared for sale in an antiquities gallery in New York City. Once scientific tests and scholarship proved that both coffins were authentic and belonged together, they were bought in the year 2000 by the Memorial Art Gallery of the University of Rochester in New York. In collections and museums around the world, there are thousands of Egyptian coffins. But from this late period of ancient Egypt, only three ensembles like this are known. So what the Memorial Art Gallery had acquired were two of the rarest objects to have survived from the ancient world. Now, their coffins would be the only ones in the United States and the only ones on public display anywhere. The coffins were in superb condition, but they had had a long passage down the centuries, and thousands of years had left their mark. So before being put on display, they would have to be studied and stabilized and conserved. Joyce Haynes is the Egyptologist who had certified the coffin's authenticity. She joins conservator Mimi Levesque and wood specialist Sean Fisher in the workshops of the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts where they begin the eight-week process of conservation. The coffins were made for a man named Pad Debuhu Asit, whose name means the one who was a request from Isis. This is a marvelous ensemble that is of high quality, and this would not be made for your average man. This was made for someone of a fairly high social status. The images on the coffins are for uh, the protection of the body, protection of the, um, the individual in his mummified state. They are the whole host of gods and goddesses who protect the individual and guide him through the next world. And this is what the inscriptions on the coffin are about. They're segments of the Book of the Dead. They're instructions for how to get safely from this world to the next world. Mimi Levesque sprays a specially formulated cleaning solution on the bottom of the anthropoid coffin. This makes the religious texts visible and allows Joyce Haynes to begin to translate them. One of the intriguing parts of the sorting out of this puzzle was that in many places on the inner coffin, the anthropoid or human-shaped coffin, the place where the man's name should have been inscribed was left blank. It was about 50% of the time. In the other instances where his name should have been written, it is written. 
That tells you that it was made in advance and ready-made, prefabricated on the shelf, waiting for the family of Pa Jebahu Asit to show up and say, yes, we'd like to buy that one, and here's the name, and they put it on. On the coffin bottom, a small patch of linen has stuck to the wood, part of the outer wrapping of Pa Debahu's mummy, clear proof that his body had once lain here in this coffin. There's plenty of evidence that people prepared for the afterlife the way we prepare for retirement, saved up, and even picked things out that you liked, that you would have put in your tomb, because this, this all had to be ready to go when you were ready to go. This coffin is a wonderful teaching tool for showing you the artist at work in ancient Egypt. What they did was they originally had an outline draftsman come through and outline the figures, sketch them quickly in red. This is how it's going to be laid out and give you a kind of a, a rough draft. Then the master draftsman would come through with black and make a much finer line, a cleaner line, give you the more finished product. And what we see on the coffin and on the shrine especially are the, all the places where the master draftsman has made corrections. So the red original line is still in place, but the master draftsman has made changes in the arm position, sometimes made changes in the actual head, whether it should be a ram or an ibis in one instance. You can see their mistakes, you can see the whole process. We're looking at the top of the shrine, the top of the coffin. This text is an offering formula, and it reads, an offering which the king gives to Osiris, the great god, lord of Saut, which is Asut, which is where Adebahu Asit lived, that he may give all things good, pure, and sweet for the Osiris. Here's his name, Adebahu Asit. A very interesting point is that the Asit, meaning Isis, the last element of his name was left off when this text was written the first time, the scribe noticed the error and went back and added it above so that the name would be complete eternally. Here an egg with a stroke, meaning son of, meaning that this father's name follows, Kansu Ir Ia'u. And his mother's name, the lady of the house, Pear. The vulture symbol is a shorthand writing for the word mother, which in ancient Egyptian transliterated as moot, the very origin of perhaps our word mother. Her name starts with this sign, which is actually a, a little outline of a house, P-R, and another R, Pear. And then this is the determinative of the name. It's unusual that the determinative is a man, actually. It should be a seated woman. That was obviously a scribal slip. So this one text gives us quite a lot of information about his parentage and about where he lived. Every inch of the coffins presents a problem. The surface is cracked. Paint and plaster and gold leaf have fallen off. This is the lid to the shrine coffin. It was constructed from a number of smaller wooden panels. You can see the lines from the construction of the panels where they fit together. The surface was then covered with gesso or a ground covering just the way you would make a panel painting and then the paint was applied to the surface. The problem is that over time, the boards have contracted, warped, changed, and they've started to separate. And so these cracks have formed. But the gesso and paint on top are not flexible. So they have cracked and broken off. The surface is lifted where the boards have changed dimension. And so you get levels where the paint simply couldn't hold. And that's why there are these losses. This area has yet to be cleaned. This area has already been cleaned. You can see the division right here. What I'm trying to do in this area is to make sure that I stabilize the paint and still allow it to be cleaned. So I'm applying first 
a material that will start to do that. It will loosen up the dirt and begin the process of stabilizing the paint. Then I'll leave that on for a few minutes and then apply another material that will complete the process and allow me to finish the cleaning. At some point in the past, someone tried to repair the coffin by painting on a lot of a sticky adhesive, something a little like Elmer's glue. They weren't able to set the pieces down properly and so some of them are put in in the wrong order and I'm going to try to clear that up a little. Then what I'm going to do is take off as much of the adhesive as I can from these edges and then fill the edges of the breaks with a mixture of of an acrylic resin and glass micro balloons that will consolidate it and also provide a surface to paint over to fill in all these gaps. A number of years ago, we were looking for a material that would be useful for the consolidation and filling of ancient Egyptian painted materials. The problem is, is that almost all of the materials we had available would stain the painted surfaces. A colleague of mine, Pam Hatchfield at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, found an advertisement for glass microballoons being used in makeup. They work very well to fill those little wrinkles on your face. And when she did some experiments, discovered that they work extremely well used with an acrylic resin to consolidate and fill spaces in ancient materials. These are tiny hollow balloons of glass. They're almost weightless. If you looked at them under the microscope, you could see their little spheres. What they do is they bulk out a resin and allow you to use it to fill gaps. I'm pouring in a resin mixture that's been made in acetone, and then I'm going to stir it all together, make like a paste with it. I try to fill only the areas that are going to need filling because of their insecurity rather than working entirely on aesthetics because this coffin is an ancient object and it has a long history that we don't want to obscure and so I try only to fill in areas where it will add strength to the coffin and not cover up any changes that have happened over time. Around the top of the head the pieces of wood often are not very well finished because they had to cut them around to make the curve and often they use smaller pieces of wood that are fitted together and so you end up with cracks in lots of unusual areas. So what's happened is, is that everything has broken away from the wood, the linen, the gesso, and the paint. In order to get underneath it, what we had to do was to inject it using a hypodermic needle to allow the solution to flow as far underneath as possible and then clamp it and leave it overnight in order for it to set properly. Then all we have to do is to seal the edges to make sure that they don't get chipped away because even with that it's still slightly separated because the wood has moved and has separated itself. The micro balloon solution will just provide that little filler to cover over this area and then we'll inpaint it so that it won't be really very noticeable. When I'm filling and painting a loss on an object, I try to adhere to the six inch, six foot rule. That is to say, if you were looking at something from a distance of about six feet, you shouldn't be able to see the loss and have it disturb your appreciation of the object. But at six inches, you should be able to see and know that there is something that's different about the object. When it's clear what the ancient artisans intended, the conservators follow their repairs by painting in the missing sections. The coffin is made out of large pieces of wood that were joined and then in order to cover up any irregularities they have completely covered it with linen and in fact it's interesting that, that one can see the linen pattern here. These pieces must have fallen out at some point in the past and were set back down by someone using some kind of a dark colored fill that I've been trying to take out and I haven't been totally successful in getting the old fill out so you can see these pieces aren't fitting as well as I'd like them to. 
I may still have more cleaning to do here. Well, I think what I'm going to do here is fill this missing area with this little block of balsa wood. And I'll start off. One of the corners of the shrine coffin has been broken off. So Sean Fisher, the team's specialist in wood conservation, painstakingly begins to fashion a piece to replace it. I am making this template so that I can transfer this profile on the end of this block. This was a recent loss, and a major one. Fitting a new corner will protect the surrounding paint and woodwork and support the structure. So that gets me started. Many of the hand tools and procedures that Sean uses would have been familiar to the ancient craftsmen who first created these coffins. From the most delicate sections of the coffins to this very visible repair, the conservators follow the same principle. From a normal viewing distance, the restoration should look like part of the original. But from a few inches away, it should be clear that this is a modern repair really the same. Maybe here there was a space, so he have to fix. Midway through the process, the conservators welcome a distinguished visitor, an old friend from Egypt. In the Boston area for a different project, Nadia Lokma is a chief conservator at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and an expert on ancient wooden objects. The team sees the coffins fresh through her eyes. You see, in, in the old time, they always do some kind of restoration. Even Nadia explains time, that because wood was so rare in ancient Egypt, the craftsmen had to make do with what they had, fitting together the pieces and covering the joints with plaster and paint. Yeah, I mean, look here. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. You see, he, he make the face in that direction, and then he changes. Nadia is the chief conservator from the Cairo Museum, and so her eye to this coffin was very beneficial. You see, isn't that wonderful? Look here. Yeah. You see the, how he did it before, and now how is it? Yeah, I it's think really that they made, uh, They were making a, a ram. Uh, oh yes, you are right. Nose. Yes, 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 my dear and lady. She picked out methods of attachment of the joints and pointed out some of the different kinds of woods. The ones that she noticed were local woods, and others that she felt needed to be imported. Oh, the details is wonderful, I think. I so. love the, the bracelets, yeah, just the wristlets, and anklets. But this yeah. is a masterpiece. All the details, I think, that's really good. Really good. Now, can't we look to the other? I'd like to look to the other one, please. The coffins are masterpieces of ancient craftsmanship. But paradoxically, it is their imperfections that seem most endearingly human. Here on the side, there's the word Osiris spelled out, and then a large blank space. And we have a number of places on the coffin where we can see the name inserted into this rather small space and kind of jammed together, because it's not quite enough space for a long name like Pa Debahu Asit has. The prayers and incantations and protective deities that the craftsmen inscribed were themselves thousands of years old when Pa Debahu died. So it's no wonder that some of the more inexperienced men in that workshop might have confused the texts or switched the attributes of Egypt's old gods. Nephthys is always shown at the head end of the coffin, Isis at the foot end. They clearly had assembled the shrine and then discovered that they had these very key goddesses in the wrong position. So you can see the erasures, you can see where the crown is changed, and in the text that accompanies it, the name Isis changed to Nephthys, and vice versa on the other end. You can just imagine what the scene was like with the supervisor complaining and saying, how could you do this as a basic rule? We can't take it apart now. It's all painted. We've got to change it. Discovering the mistakes that were corrected and those that weren't has the effect of erasing the thousands of years between ancient Egypt and the 21st century. This close to these fabulous coffins, being restored to new life inch by inch, the conservators come face to face with the artisans who made them. I'm going to stop the filling here because leaving this area allows you to see right into 
the join. It sort of lets you look into the mind of the ancient Egyptian carpenter. You can see the tenon that's going into the hole, the mortise, on the post on this side. You can see the peg that locked the tenon into place. And then the sidewall of the post on this side and the panel on that side. It seems possible to imagine oneself back inside that artist workshop along the Nile over 2,000 years ago. Outside, the sounds of children and animals. Inside, the smell of paint and ink and glue, the sound of chisels and saws, and the murmur of artists bending over their work. We can almost look over their shoulders as they make these coffins, these ritual containers that will protect the body of Pad Debahu Aset. From here, his spirit can safely begin its eternal daily rounds, from the darkness of the tomb to the warm sunlight and the sweet life of the next world.